Okay, thanks so much. Um, we are we are actually giving a um, a co-authored talk here, so it's not truly a panel, but a talk, and we're going to take turns through different parts of it. But before uh, we get going, I, I just want to start by thanking the London Public Library um, for partnering uh, with us with the philosophy department for so many years in this philosophy series. I also want to thank my colleague Eric and our Rotman administrator Deborah, both of whom have worked hard on this series, and I appreciate them both immensely. I am uh, thrilled to be presenting this talk alongside um, Carissa and Sinead. Uh, and Eric mentioned they, they actually shared an undergraduate student research internship uh, at Western that I supervised this summer. Uh, they both had taken a course that I teach called Power, Oppression and Privilege, uh, and they were keen to do further work on topics related to that. So I hired them for a USRI, it's called. Um, we decided together to research race, distrust, and vaccine hesitancy, mainly because of events that were happening um, last summer and are still happening. Um, the research we've done together has been invaluable to me in providing a case study for a broader research, a research project I have on the distrust of socially marginalized groups in public institutions. Um, so this case study concerns people who are socially marginalized because of their race, it, it concerns their distrust in medicine and government, and then vaccine hesitancy. Okay. Uh, to start out, I want to consider a, a, us to consider a stark division, I think, that exists in our society around vaccine mandates, passports, or, or the like. Uh, most Canadians do favor mandates, uh, and many, especially those who are vaccinated, have little patience or sympathy for people who don't get vaccinated. Uh, that's true, at least according to the Angus Reid poll that's referenced in the bottom left on the slide. Um, unsympathetic views about the unvaccinated are, are frequently expressed in the media. Uh, one example that I particularly like is from an op-ed by Gary Mason in the Globe and Mail. This was wrote, written in July of this year. Um, and there he, he said, this is a quote, we continue to pander to a group who in many cases are simply too lazy to sign up to get a shot or they continue to embrace crackpot conspiracy theories and misinformation being spread on social media. We patiently hope that they will wake up and see the light one day. Meantime, their recalcitrance affects the rest of us. So that's one side of the social divide, a strong stance in favor of mandates against the, the unvaccinated. And the other side is made up of people who oppose mandates and, and usually they claim to be staunch defenders of our freedom, like in, in the images on this slide. Um, so often I think the public debate on mandates makes it seem like these are the only possible or sort of reasonable positions to take. Um, but we do think the moral situation is more complicated than that. Uh, so one could, for example, be in favor of vaccine mandates, depending perhaps on how they're they're instituted, while at the same time being sympathetic to at least some people who haven't gotten vaccinated. Um, that's our position. Uh, to be clear, we are in favor of COVID-19 COVID vaccine mandates and vaccines, um, but we do believe that greater patience and sympathy should be shown towards some people who are vaccine hesitant. And we're particularly concerned here about people who are hesitant because of what we call medical racism, and we're going to define that term. So, so one point of focus for our talk is clearly vaccine hesitancy, which we define as the reluctance to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines. We don't only define it that way, others do too. Uh, vaccine hesitancy needs to be distinguished from vaccine refusal since some vaccine hesitant people have not ruled out being vaccinated. We're also focused in the talk on vaccine hesitancy within certain racialized communities, particularly black and indigenous communities, and mainly those in North America. And we're interested in distrust that fuels some vaccine hesitancy in these communities and is born out of that phenomenon I mentioned earlier of, of medical racism. So it's born out of that as opposed to misinformation or laziness or something else. Um, following Maya Goldenberg, who, who wrote a book about vaccine hesitancy that we recommended for this talk, um, we think all vaccine hesitancy involves some distrust 
So, so all of it exists because people are distrustful of someone or something or other. But we're interested in cases where the distrust has a particular source. So namely, again, um, what we call medical racism. Let, let me say before moving on briefly why we're, why we're focused on Black and Indigenous communities or peoples. Uh, we chose Black communities mainly because rates of vaccine hesitancy are particularly high in those communities, as we'll see. And we chose Indigenous peoples not because they've shown high rates of vaccine hesitancy, but because they've experienced medical racism to a similar degree, we think, or even worse perhaps than Black people, it's probably very similar. And that in turn can explain why some indigenous people are in fact vaccine hesitant. And we do know that some, some are. Okay, moving along. So our main concern is that some people are ignoring or simply unaware that racism can cause vaccine hesitancy. It can be at the root of that response to the vaccines. And we're concerned that some responses uh, like these people are just lazy is insensitive to this fact. Okay, so we will argue that that the opposite should occur. So sh people should be sensitive to this fact. And we'll try to show how they could show that sensitivity while advocating for strict policies concerning vaccination, like mandates. So there are three sections to the talk in total. Uh, the first, which will be covered by Carissa, uh, discusses medical racism as a source of vaccine hesitancy, more specifically of that distrust that causes vaccine hesitancy within Black and Indigenous populations. And, and we'll just outline the facts here and look at the origins of that distrust. The second section, which I'm going to run through, uh, focuses on the psychological burden on those distrusting, and that the burden imposed by, more specifically, by vaccine mandates or passports on the relevant racialized groups. Um, and we'll talk about why those who implement those policies need to take that burden seriously. And the last section, which Sinead will cover, is about responding to the distrust. Um, so she'll talk about how policymakers can begin to address the psychological burden that's discussed in section two. Okay, I'm gonna pass things over to Carissa. Hi, I'm Carissa and I'll be exploring medical racism as a source of vaccine hesitancy among black and indigenous peoples in Canada and the United States. I'll explain how we're understanding medical racism and how it can and very likely does cause some vaccine hesitancy in these communities. When discussing medical racism, I'll mention both historical and current racial injustices that Black and Indigenous people have experienced in medical contexts. But first, I want to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the racial groups we're concerned with. Looking at some Canadian data first, we have information about the impact of COVID-19 on visible minorities, a group defined by Statistics Canada to include Black people, but not Indigenous peoples. From January 2020 to January 2021, neighborhoods with 25% or more visible minorities had a COVID-19 mortality rate that was two times greater than neighborhoods with less than 1% visible minorities, and that's across Canada. The rate was 10, 10 times higher in British Columbia. The data on Indigenous people in Canada is similarly bad, and especially dire in Manitoba, where last July, First Nations peoples represented 65% of the province's new cases, 68% of active cases, 34% of hospitalizations, and 32% of ICU patients. And for reference, Indigenous peoples make up approximately 10.6% of the population in Manitoba. And thankfully, the case numbers within this population have been decreasing. And turning to the United States, as of September 9th of this year, Black and Hispanic people were 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 and two times more likely to die compared to white Americans. And Native Americans were 3.5 times more likely to be hospitalized and 2.4 times more likely to die, according to the CDC. And this data shows that in both Canada and the United States, COVID-19 disproportionately impacts Indigenous peoples and visible minorities, which include, includes Black people. This fact is concerning given that these populations already face serious health inequities, which is something we'll discuss later. Despite the increased risk of severe illness and death, Black people in both Canada and the U.S. display the highest rate of vaccine hesitancy among visible minorities. 
A study surveying almost 3,000 Canadians from May to June of this year found that Black Canadians were the most hesitant of all racial groups. And the literature shows that African Americans have the lowest COVID-19 vaccination rate of any racial or ethnic group in the US. By contrast, Indigenous peoples are much less vaccine hesitant. 71.9% of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples surveyed by Statistics Canada in March of 2021 were open to taking the vaccine. But there is nevertheless evidence of some vaccine hesitancy among Indigenous peoples. For example, a First Nations family physician and the Director of Indigenous Health at Queen's University spoke earlier this year about Indigenous patients of hers who are vaccine hesitant because of traumatizing experiences they have experienced in medical spaces. So seeing as COVID-19 disproportionately impacts Black and Indigenous communities, why then would some members of these communities display hesitancy toward the vaccine? The answer is that we don't fully know why. Vaccine hesitancy in racialized communities is understudied, and so empirical, more empirical data is needed. And with that said, we do know some things about this phenomenon. Importantly, we know that medical racism is a major predictor of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy among African Americans and Black Canadians, and that it is a factor that explains some vaccine hesitancy among Indigenous peoples. Medical racism refers to actions, policies, or norms within the medical system that discriminate against people based on their race and that contributes to racial inequities in healthcare. Medical racism is carried out by actors within the medical system, including government, policymakers, medical regulators, clinicians, and other medical professionals. Like with racism generally, it is systemic and so it is embedded within social systems or structures. But it is also perpetuated often unwittingly by individuals who work within the medical system and we'll see examples of that later. To be, to be clear, we don't believe that medical racism is necessarily more insidious or problematic than the racism that pervades other domains of people's lives. We focus on it simply because it is most relevant to our topic of vaccine hesitancy. Also, our point is not that medical racism drives all vaccine hesitancy in these communities. Vaccine hesitancy is not a monolithic entity within any population subgroup. So we now want to discuss the medical racism that Black and Indigenous communities have suffered. And here we'll mention both historical racial injustices and current everyday injustices. Even though Black people are among those most distrustful of the COVID-19 vaccine, the practice of variolation was actually introduced in the United States by a Black slave in response to an outbreak of smallpox. In the 1700s, Onesimus informed his enslaver about how injecting infectious material into a person's skin could prevent them from becoming deathly ill with smallpox later on. But instead of crediting him for his life-saving contributions and looking to enslave Africans as sources of credible medical advice, slaves were abused by medical doctors who used them as guinea pigs for experimental vaccines, surgeries, and medicines on the grounds that they were subhuman and had an exceptionally high pain tolerance. And medical abuse did not stop after slavery was abolished. Let me illustrate using just one case, which involves vaccination, and comes from Harriet A. Washington's award-winning book, Medical Apartheid. So between 1987 to 1991, government-sponsored US researchers wanted to test dosage strengths for an experimental measles vaccine and administered 500 times the approved dosage to African-American and Hispanic babies in impoverished Los Angeles communities without informing their parents about what they were doing or about the fact that the vaccine had fatal results in infants in Haiti. The parents also were not informed that the World Health Organization had abandoned the plan to go further with administering these vaccines. Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General and Director for the CDC, apologized for this in 1996. Medical institutions have carried out a plethora of abhorrent abuses against Black people throughout history, which has trickled down to cause the unease and distrust we see today towards representatives of these institutions, including physicians and medical researchers. Like Black Americans, Indigenous peoples in Canada have not so distant memories of being abused by medical researchers, and several of the relevant research trials involved vaccines. When Indigenous children in Canada were forcibly removed from their families and sent to residential schools, vaccines were tested on them without consent from them or their parents. 
One of the experiments was the bacille calmet Guerin vaccine trial that ran from the 1930s to the 1940s in Saskatchewan and aimed to prevent tuberculosis. This vaccine was tested on Cree and Nakoda Oyadebi infants and was approved by Canada's National Research Council. Some of the infants who did not receive the, sorry, some of the infants who did not survive the trials were buried in unmarked graves because Indian Affairs, as it was then called, refused to pay for the bodies to be sent back to their home communities. And to this day, some survivors of the residential school system recall feeling like guinea pigs and are fearful of the Canadian medical system because of the legacy of racist paternalism and colonialism. When the distrust of Black or Indigenous people get discussed in these contexts, in these contexts, historical injustices are often credited as the primary source. However, attributing the distrust solely to historical abuses minimizes the impact of everyday acts of injustice and racism in medical spaces. Black and Indigenous patients today are dismissed and have their concerns invalidated frequently within both the Canadian and American medical systems. Current everyday injustices can fuel the distrust that causes vaccine hesitancy, as noted by Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith, an American physician who is the chair of the Biden-Harris COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Here's a quotation from her. When people say, I have skepticism, I have questions, I honor that. For many people, this is grounded in reality. Many folks don't have to look back to Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks. They can look to an experience they or their family members have had interacting with the healthcare system this week or this month that left them feeling that perhaps there is a bias in the system against them. We'll take a close look at some of these everyday injustices, including stereotyping, implicit biases, and an underrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people among medical professionals. There are other such injustices, but of course, we can't cover them all. So we'll consider first stereotyping and implicit biases. Philosopher Lawrence Blum defines stereotypes as false or misleading generalizations about a group that are held by subjects who resist evidence to the contrary. He also describes how all stereotyping is harmful, but stereotyping where the content of the stereotype is very negative, such as that Indigenous people are drunkards, is especially harmful. Indeed, it is a tool of oppression. Stereotyping and implicit biases are linked together, where implicit bias occurs when people act or think on the basis of stereotypes without intending to do so. Often, stereotyping is unconscious. In other words, it occurs as implicit bias. People of color face stereotyping and implicit biases everywhere. However, it is deeply unnerving when these things occur in medical settings because as patients, they are in a vulnerable position with someone they must rely on to make important decisions about their well-being. When, pa when patients are stereotyped, they may become reluctant to continue accessing medical services, or when they do access these services, they may feel the need to strategize about how to reduce their likelihood of being discriminated against. And let's look at some instances of stereotyping and implicit biases that have, tar that have targeted Black and Indigenous patients. Black women in reproductive spaces have, in dozens of studies, reported feeling stigmatized as uncooperative, single mothers, or welfare recipients. In addition, some physicians still believe the fictitious narrative stemming from slavery days that Black people feel less pain. Some physicians will imply that Black patients who complain about pain are being dramatic or are drug seekers, whereas they are more likely to legitimize the concerns of white patients. Indigenous patients have reported that stereotyping is rampant in interactions between them and non-Indigenous clinicians. There seems to be a common and damaging trope about Indigenous people being drunks or drug addicts. Other stereotypes surround their lifestyles, upbringing, level of education, education, and housing status. And this hostile environment was brought to national attention in 2020 with the tragic case of Joyce Echequan, an Indigenous woman in Quebec who spent her dying moments recording a Facebook Live that showed nurses taunting and insulting her, calling her stupid as she called, cried out in pain. Another form of everyday injustice that has contributed to the distrust of the COVID-19 vaccine is the underrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people among medical professionals, especially among doctors and scientific researchers. 
For example, a 2020 study that surveyed 1,388 Canadian medical students found that when compared to the 2016 Canadian census population, respondents were less likely to identify as Black or Indigenous. 1.7% of medical students were Black, compared to the national population percentage of 6.4%, and 3.5% of students were Indigenous, compared to the national population percentage of 3.4%. As we mentioned earlier, when patients seek information about COVID-19 vaccines, they often seek counsel from physicians. Due to breakdowns in patient-physician communication that stem from racial biases against Black and Indigenous patients, there is a pervasive sense of distrust, and for some, a fear of doctors. Patients who do not trust their healthcare provider will be wary of taking advice from them. Dr. Ato Seki Otu, a Canadian orthopedic surgeon says, while there is a concern about the speed of development of COVID-19 vaccines, there also seems to be a lack of trust in the vaccine delivery mechanism, which is a direct comment on the face of healthcare professionals in our country. I know from my own experience as a medical practitioner of many years that Black Canadians often don't see themselves rep reflected in the medical system around them. And that's true for the practice of administering vaccines, as it is in any other facet of Canadian healthcare. Not seeing oneself in the medical system is, we believe, an everyday injustice and one that contributes to medical racism, making it more likely to occur. We've examined several forms of medical racism, but be reminded that medical racism for Black and Indigenous populations is both historical and current. Some of the historical injustices involve vaccinations, which causes some members of these groups to worry about being guinea pigs yet again. The root of some COVID-19 vaccine within these groups or of the distrust that causes their hesitancy is medical racism. Now I'll turn it over to Professor McLeod. Thanks so much, uh, Carissa. That was great. That was a lot to go through. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. Uh, so the title of uh, this next section of our talk is the psychological burden on those distrusting. So here, uh, the focus is on the psychological impact of facing something like a vaccine mandate or the need to obtain a vaccine passport. And we're concerned, of course, about the impact specifically on someone whose distrust and vaccine hesitancy stems from medical racism. Um, Sorry, one thing I wanted to, to mention about this section too is that rather than focus on empirical studies, I'm going to be drawing on philosophical uh, literature about trust and distrust. Okay, for this section, I'll argue in favor of two claims. Um, both of them concern policy measures like mandatory vaccination or vaccine passports. So the first is claim A, that implementing these measures places a psychological burden, a serious one, on those who are distrusting. And again, we're focusing on those distrusting because of medical racism. Although I do think there can be a psycho serious psychological burden for other people who are vaccine hesitant or vaccine hesitant for other reasons. The second claim here is B, that this burden on the groups we're concerned with deserves a careful moral response. And again, it may be that a careful moral response, one that's compassionate, takes the distrust seriously, is required for, for all vaccine hesitancy. That, that may be true, um, but we won't be arguing for that here. Okay. So turning to some philosophical literature about um, distrust in particular, which will sort of give you some background information for the arguments that I mentioned that I'm gonna make. Uh, the, the most substantial account of distrust in philosophy, the most comprehensive one, I think, comes from the late uh, Catherine Hawley. Uh, she argues uh, that distrust is a form of non-reliance. So when we distrust people, we do not rely on them. Now, that's not to say that distrust is the same as non-reliance, um, there, because there can be non-reliance without distrust. So, for example, I cannot rely on my mother to finance my life without in any way distrusting my mother. Now, in a paper I'm writing with PhD student Halle Dole, uh, one of my PhD students, uh, we argue that Catherine Halle is, is wrong in saying that distrust or suggesting that it's always a form of non-reliance, because sometimes, and perhaps often, that's just not the case. Uh, so we have in mind circumstances where people are forced to rely on people that they distrust or institutions that they distrust. Uh, 
And we think that actually happens um, particular to marginalized people uh, all the time. For example, they're forced to rely on public institutions like those of healthcare or policing while distrusting those institutions. So, so in short, distrust and non-reliance may often go together. I think we'd agree with Catherine about that, but they also do come apart and distrust sometimes is coupled with, with reliance. Now let me let me highlight one further philosophical claim about distrust, and that is that it tends to be resistant to counter evidence or evidence that would disprove it. So to give an example, if I distrust my neighbor, then I'm likely to discount or ignore evidence suggesting that he's actually trustworthy. And you can make the same point, in fact, about, about trust. It's true of trust and distrust. So I'm going to draw on these points in, in the remaining slides in this section. For those of you who do want to learn more about the philosophy of distrust and trust, um, I, I do have uh, an, an entry in what's called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and it's just called Trust, but it includes a section on distrust. OK. So recall in this section, we want to try to prove two claims about policy measures like mandatory vaccination. And the first is that claim A, that implementing these measures places a psychological burden on those distrusting. Now, to explain why that's true, uh, consider that the distrust is not likely to be overcome in the short term. So, so getting vaccinated um, or adhering to the mandate would involve relying on medical professionals while distrusting them. What's that experience like? I've asked that on the slide. It involves basically expecting the worst, but going through it because you feel you have no choice. Why is the distrust not likely to be overcome in the short term? The answer there is that it will be recalcitrant or resistant to counter evidence as all distrust is. And the deeper the distrust is, the more recalcitrant it's likely to be. Note that for the racialized people we're concerned with in the talk, the distrust will run deep if they frequently heard about those historical injustices that Carissa mentioned while they were growing up, and if they frequently experience or have people close to them experience those current everyday injustices. Now, the alternative for these people is to choose not to be vaccinated. The alternative to to actually being vaccinated is not to be vaccinated and then face the consequences of that, which are serious when there are policies of mandatory vaccination or vaccine passports in place. So what, what that previous slide suggests is that the overall burden um, you know, on these vaccine hesitant people lies in them being placed in double bind. A double bind is where you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. So in other words, these people are, are cornered, essentially, by these policies. There are serious psychological burdens associated with each side of that double bind. There's the burden of having to rely while distrusting, so rely on medical professionals while distrusting, which is stressful. Uh, and that on the other side, there's dealing with the problems or the stress of remaining unvaccinated. So turning to that second claim, we wanted to argue for that the burden deserves a careful moral response. Um, you know, again, we're focused on cases where the distrust is rooted in medical racism. We believe that that claim, claim B, is true for two main reasons. First, that the distrust is likely justified, and two, that the burden likely contributes to racism. So that the first point there, the just, that the distrust is likely justified, um, this distrust that's motivated by medical racism. Why is that so? Why is it likely justified? The answer is simply that there's good reason to have it, the reasons laid out by Carissa. And one might object and say, you know, how could any distrust in COVID-19 vaccines or vaccine providers be justified given how much evidence there is about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines? To respond to that, the distrust we're concerned with does not target actually the safety or efficacy of the vaccines, at least not directly. Rather, it targets the motivations of those who are responsible for the vaccine rollout and whether they can be relied on to have the best interests of Black or Indigenous people at heart. I do want to emphasize that saying that the relevant distrust is justified is not the same as saying that it's well-grounded or accurate. Um, 
sorry, I've lost my place here. All right, so in other words, it's not the same as saying that the vaccine providers are actually untrustworthy toward black and indigenous people. They may be, they may not be. That's true because attitudes that can be justified without them being well-grounded or accurate. So for example, I could be justified in believing there's milk in the fridge in my house because I got three bags of it this morning, even if my son Mickey has managed to drink or spill all of the milk already. That would be unusual, although you know it's certainly possible. <laughs> okay. I've also noted on the slide here that the relevant distrust is at least understandable and, and regrettable, that is, even if it's not justified. And, and for those reasons alone, that it's understandable and regrettable, it should be taken seriously. A second reason to take that, that burden, that psychological burden seriously is that it likely contributes to racism or more specifically to the oppression that black and indigenous people face because of how they're racialized. So why might it do that? Um, one reason has to do with them facing a double bind as a member of these groups. So in other words, they face that double bind that I discussed earlier insofar as they're black or indigenous and impression itself is characterized by double binds of that sort. That's the view of Marilyn Fry about oppression, which she defends in this fam famous chapter called Oppression in her book, The Politics of Reality. I think that point that was pointed out by Mina, who gave the talk a week ago in this series, this idea that oppression is characterized by double binds. Okay, so the upshot of this second section of our talk is, is this. Measures like mandatory vaccination place a psychological burden on those distrusting of choosing in a double bind. Uh, this burden should be taken very seriously because of the epistemic status of that distrust, that it's likely justified, and because of the likely connection between the burden and oppression. Now, especially given that last point about oppression, you might be thinking, well, maybe we just shouldn't impose policies like mandatory vaccination on racialized people who, who are vaccine hesitant because of medical racism. Um, but we don't think that's the right way to go because we think the policies themselves are necessary for everyone's safety and their ability to lead a somewhat normal life. So the path we should pursue instead is try to lessen that burden while sticking with these policies. So I'm gonna pass things over to Sinead now who will discuss responding to the distrust while keeping these sort of policies in place. Thank you, Professor McLeod. Hi everyone, my name is Sinead Ostermo and I'll be taking over this section and discussing the third part of our presentation which has to do with responding to the distrust, namely distrust that is rooted in medical racism and causes vaccine hesitancy. We're concerned specifically with how policymakers should respond. Some people think that policymakers have done enough already to respond to the vaccine hesitancy, generally, and it's true that they've done quite a lot. For example, they've offered people financial incentives to get vaccinated, vaccine promoting messages from trusted members of their community, and education about the vaccines. In Canada, some provinces, including Manitoba, implemented a system whereby those who received their vaccinations were entered into a lottery system. Some think that these efforts are more than adequate, that now, as Gary Mason puts it, it's time to get tough with resistors. Presumably, what he means by that is that we should simply penalize people who don't get vaccinated and stop trying to persuade them to change their mind. But is that the right way, right way to proceed? Has our society done enough already to respond to this distress by trying to lessen it? To answer the question from the previous slide, no, we have not done enough. In fact, more is needed. Many of the measures that have been implemented, such as financial incentives and education about the vaccines, do not target the roots of distrust that stems from medical racism. They also do not take seriously that the distrust may be justified. Note that if the distrust is justified, then the focus should really be on the one distrusted rather than, the, rather than those distrusting active effort should be made to demonstrate that medicine is more trustworthy than it has shown itself to be or that it will be in the future. We share these views outlined here with Dorothy Roberts, a famous scholar on race and bioethics. She says, 
It's not that Black people have an irrational fear of new medical technologies, it's that they have an awareness of a long history of being disrespected, mistreated, and violated by the government and by healthcare professionals. If we start out with the assumption that Black people have to be vaccinated, have to be convinced to trust the vaccine because there's a problem with Black people's attitude towards medicine and science, that's the wrong approach. The approach should be how can medicine and science be made more deserving of Black people's trust. Armed with a better understanding of the roots of the relevant distrust, as well as the implications, what can be done now? Briefly on this slide are two examples of measures that could be implemented to try and alleviate some of the distrust and encourage more people to be vaccinated. The first is to have medical institutions make commitments to Black and Indigenous communities to do better. This may take the form of an increased education to medical students and medical professionals about racial stereotyping. While the creation of these commitments is important, it should also be emphasized that abiding by these commitments is what is most important. The second measure is to take the relevant communities more, to make the relevant communities, sorry, more aware of the measures that have already been taken to improve the trustworthiness of medical science and practice for them. An example of efforts to increase the number of Black or Indigenous doctors in Canada, which have already been put into motion by universities such as Western with its access pathway, Queens with its QUARMS, and Toronto with its um, minority application stream. Measures like these take seriously where the distrust is coming from, which is medical racism as we've outlined previously. Whether these are the right measures to take right now is, not, is something that policymakers would need to decide in consultation with these communities, specifically Black and Indigenous communities. Measures like those recommended on the previous slide should or could at least ease the psychological burden of getting vaccinated. With that being said, the measures won't completely erase this difficulty, especially for those whose distrust runs deep. Such distrust is not something that will disappear overnight. And given that, we should continue to actively look for solutions to this problem. To conclude our whole presentation, we've highlighted here some key points. Our primary interest has been on race and vaccine hesitancy and how the sources of this hesitancy can differ from members of different racial groups. The historical injustices faced by Black and Indigenous peoples, along with forces like stereotyping and implicit biases still present in medicine today, explain why medical racism is a source of distrust and vaccine hesitancy for these groups. Policy measures like mandatory vaccination are morally contentious because of their impact on these groups. They are psychologically burdensome in ways that are very much like the oppressive. The conclusion we should reach is not that there should be no mandatory vaccination, but that it should, become, it should be accompanied by efforts to eliminate medical racism, taking into account the roots of this distrust. Finally, let me add that in those efforts, consulting with the communities and adapting as necessary will be very crucial. Thanks, Sinead. Wonderful. Um, Thanks everyone. Uh, here's our thank you slide. Thank you for your attention. Um, we do really look forward to hearing your thoughts on our presentation uh, on the topics that, that we've discussed. I think it is a, a complex issue. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks to the three of you. That was a wonderful talk. I think that you make a very strong case, in fact. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it is it is touchy too. But uh, on the other hand, one thing that I really appreciate is how you show that there's this third option to look at the the hesitancy that it's so often just ignored, and we the media tend to polarize those two. Uh, so being lazy or just being conspiracy theorists, no, there it's it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, so very well done. So uh, now we. Uh, we... Can I stop sharing, Eric? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. You can stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to start the Q&A session. Uh, so if you have questions for the three speakers, um, if you could just write them down uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and then the questions are going to be fed to the speakers. Um, so yeah, I don't see questions yet. I just have to open another document. Sorry. 
maybe I'm going to try one. So the, the questions sometimes are slow to trickle in. Um, so uh, I, I like the, the suggestions that were made. And I really like uh, as we, so we have to think about the root of the problem, right? And it sounds like in, from what I gathered from your uh, suggestion, um, that the root, so addressing the root of, of the problem is, is going to be taking a lot of time. Like before we get more uh, minorities in uh, in the health system and and we establish like connections and so on. Uh, in a situation like a pandemic, for example, where we, we can need to act quickly, uh, are there uh, suggestions that you, you have thought of or things that you think we could uh, perhaps do to to alleviate the, the hesitancy or at least try to establish already a communication that doesn't involve maybe training more people and giving more black and indigenous people in the, the medical uh, practice. Sorry, Eric, I just got booted out of Zoom. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's good that you were just by Sinead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll. Um, maybe you could pose a question that Sinead or I, Carissa I, could. Yeah. I don't. Did you? So did you hear what uh, I was asking? Uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, things that might have already perhaps been so beside lottery and, and financial incentive? There, there must be other things that have been done, right? Or, or tried, or hopefully. I, I don't know. It's not something I've been looking into. In regards to the current pandemic situation, I think there has been efforts um, to alleviate some of that, um, I guess, distrust, distrust, particularly within the Black community. Um, even so, here in London, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Middle Sex Women Health Unit has been in contact with the Black Network, and they've also reached out to a lot of community leaders, um, Black community leaders, as well as um, clubs here on campus. Um, and they've opened these um, vaccination clinics um, geared towards Black people and minorities. And I think that did um, boost and help to have that representation. They may not have been within a medical field, but just seeing people within your own community helping to um, provide those vaccinations or helping to answer those questions regarding it. And, you know, acting as a mediator between themselves and healthcare professionals don't necessarily look like us. So I think they did a great, great job in getting that first step. Obviously, it's a long way to go. But um, for how quickly it was implemented considering the current climate, I think that is a great first step. Um, it's just a matter of continuing it from here on out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so now the questions are coming in. So I'm gonna, uh, so the first question is from Chris. And Chris is asking, are there historical cases where policymakers overcame similar types of justified distrust in institutions? Um, okay. Can you repeat that just one more time, sorry? Yes, sure. So uh, Chris is asking whether uh, there are historical cases that you might be aware of uh, where policymakers overcame similar types of just justified distrust in institutions. Oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, I can't, I don't know if uh, Chris, you want to respond to I can't think of specific examples offhand. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some right now. And honestly, I don't know. Like, I feel like in every sector, whether it's politics, education, healthcare, there's a lot of distress and they're actively working right now to fix like wrong, right a lot of the wrongs from the past. So I can't think right now of any, but I'll have to look into that because that's a very interesting question. Yeah. I guess I could think about, I mean, it, you know, it's certainly something that policymakers are working on with respect to the child welfare context uh, in Canada when it comes to um, Indigenous peoples, but also Black Canadians and their distrust in those institutions. And certainly one thing that's happening in, uh, for Indigenous people is more control has been given to them to, to govern um, their own communities uh, and you know, provide child welfare services themselves instead of having them provided by outsiders to the community. 
Yeah, so I mean, that really is like our, our point about underrepresentation. Yeah. I mean, in a way, just having members of the community more involved in actually providing the services in the first place. I mean, I think there's still a long way to go with respect to fixing child welfare in Canada, but, but I think that those are steps that are being taken there, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, and and maybe we're we're just too much in it to see that there are successful cases. Maybe with time we're going to see some successful cases, but right now the, the injustice is so it's right there. We're we're in the middle of it, and we're still it's coming out, and we're starting to understand how systemic those things are. But yeah. Um, so uh, next question is from uh, Shinta. Uh, so Shinta asks: Sometimes financial incentives also come with distrust and suspicions. Do you believe financial incentives are a good way to convince people to take the vaccine? Chris? Yeah, I'll jump in. I actually feel like financial incentives um, sometimes are not a good way, especially if you're, you know, for example, in African Americans, where we do know there is a massive issue with poverty, and if you say, "Okay, I'm going to pay you for the vaccine to take the vaccine," it might come across of, "Okay, they're trying to come and target um, low-income, you know, black or Hispanic, et cetera, people," and then automatically red flags everywhere. So I do think financial incentives are a little bit tricky. I personally wouldn't be in favor of that, but yeah, yeah, especially to deal with the problem that we're mm -hmm. we're focusing on yeah. mm -hmm. thank you uh, next question from mark so uh mark first thanks for says thanks for this great talk uh, do you have thoughts or whether ex uh, exemptions to vaccine mandates that take race into account are ever appropriate and if so what such a policy might look like mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something that we, I think, thought about, um, you know, especially given, I mean, one thing I would say, I, I, I don't think we're in favor of, ex of those exemptions. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I think it's pretty clear that in order to reach herd immunity, you know, we need to have as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, but I do think it's, you know, it's an interesting question uh, and, uh, you know, I know many people are going to react badly to this, what I'm about to say, but, you know, if there are exemptions based on religion, then I'm not sure there shouldn't be on the basis of race um, for where the hesitancy, you know, stems, has a similar, you know, the kind of source that we've been talking about in this talk. I mean, I can certainly understand having exemptions for medical reasons, mm -hmm. but, but if it, the only other exemptions are religious, and, you know, the source of the vaccine hesitancy kind that we're talking about, you know, it resides in a kind of moral political kind of objection to having to be, to having to have that interaction with medicine, with the whole establishment, if you don't want to. I, you know, it's a similar kind of objection to the religious one, ultimately. And so I'm just not sure that a policy that justifies exemptions on the basis of religion and not, you know, other sort of, not the kinds of objections we're talking about. I just don't, I don't see how that's really coherent myself, but what do you think? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I agree also. And I think the implementation of exemptions based on the concept of race, I think it will in some ways minimize the active efforts to to remedy um, these, in, like the roots of the distrust and these injustices, um, it would just serve as a band aid. Um, we, it might be like a saying, like we we recognize what we've done. Here's your choice out. Instead of saying, okay, like how can we go forward? Um, what steps can be taken? So, mm -hmm. I I I believe it might be more damaging in in a ways um, in terms of our future um, to provide an exemption based on race, and in some ways it will could create more of a division um, because mm -hmm. who's to say our race, um, because of our historical injustices, um, we had more than another. It's gonna, it's gonna create a bit of an issue, I believe. So um, I'm not in favor of it, but I can recognize why it would be implemented. Mm 
I mean, at the same time, I think we have to consider two other groups that are not racialized that may have similar distrust in the medical establishment. I mean, some LGBTQ people, for example, have deep distrust mm -hmm. because of how they've been treated. So, I mean, we focused on race because that's, you know, that's our topic and the topic of the series. But I don't think these are the only marginalized groups that may have this this kind of the kind of distrust that we're talking about. So, so this could just really kind of whoop, there goes my math, <laughs> proliferate, and there could just be too many too many groups we're giving exemptions to, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. That was a great answer. Um, so our oh, sorry next question from uh, so from Dr. Laurent Hay Hayward, uh, who says, great talk. So, uh, so Laurent is a physician with public health unit. And he says, so we have some cultural groups, example, Mennonite and Amish, so it might connect to the, the answer you just gave, who are very private and hard to engage and that are vaccinate hesitant. Do you have any tips on how to approach groups like this that have a very pri uh, private nature. Mm. That's a good. I mean, that's not. I mean, I you know, I, I don't feel sort of confident to answer that. Um, just given that it's a little further afield from what we focused on, but um, yeah, I don't know if I mean, it's a bit out of our scope of research. But I will say, when it comes to addressing any sort of group outside of a group or community outside of your own, especially those of reserve, it's to identify one, their culture and how they go about things. I think how you approach them should be based on their general standards. Um, and also identifying the leader or spokesperson, again, usually in those quiet communities, you'll have someone who tends to be the mediator or in-between person with them and outside communities. So just identifying that person and, and consulting with them, kind of what we mentioned in our um, presentation at the end, um, is consulting with those people the best way to go about things um, and not necessarily enforcing your views. Um, so yeah, definitely just approaching them based on their cultural standards and also identifying their spokesperson, I could say. You know, I do think that the philosophical stuff that I was discussing about distrust can be kind of helpful in just um, at least acknowledging why or understanding why, you know, simply providing groups like these with more information is not necessarily going to make the distrust disappear. I mean, distrust, you know, especially if it is deeply rooted, is, is something that's very difficult to dislodge. I mean, we, we can kind of lessen it, we can do things to try to lessen it, but if we expect that, you know, it, it, it could just go away, if we could only come up with the right sort of information to provide, then, then that's expecting too much. I mean, distrust just isn't like that. Uh, any, any measure, any attempt to get rid of it is gonna be a long, a long process, and that's just because of the nature of distrust itself. Yeah. Yeah, and and as you mentioned in the talk, like it's a uh, there's some I don't I'm not sure what's the best way of calling this, but there's some kind of group effect, right? It's not the decision is not just by one person and their own individual experiences, by what you hear and by so th there are people within your community that share your values that also have this hesitancy or distrust, and then it's kind of makes things extremely difficult. Yeah. But I really like your answer, Sinead. Like it's, it was it's very wise, I think. <laughs> First establish communication, right? So, and, and it's gotta be communication. It's gotta be both ways. It can't just be imposed. And I quite like that. Uh, so our next question from Emma. Uh, so thank you for the important and very insightful seminar this evening. Uh, what are your suggestions for future directions in terms of decreasing the burden of medical racism? Yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I think one of our, you know, one of our main suggestions would be to increase the representation of Black and Indigenous people um, within these professions. Um, but we also mentioned, you know, just, I mean, I know there's some discussion already in many medical schools about things like stereotyping, uh, but there also tends to be in medical schools, 
little time devoted to bioethics education uh, or education of the sort that we're discussing. And, and I do think it does need to be prioritized. And it is in some, in some medical schools, I think. Uh, but often that, that's very difficult to do because there's just so much that uh, you know, is expected of medical students to learn that sometimes bioethics gets sort of sh shuffled to the side. So um, I think having more opportunities to discuss these things uh, you know, ideally with a more diverse group of students uh, would, would certainly help. Any thoughts? I agree. I think it's a constant reiteration of, um, of the implicit bias and stereotypes that we tend to hold or acquire as we go throughout life and just continuing to make sure that we're understanding those and recognizing our signs, both in the medical context, like in terms of um, medical school, but also within the hospital, as you, as professionals within their profession, I think once you reach that point, it gets less and less that you discuss it, even though you tend to deal with the wider array of, um, of uh, patients. Um, I think it's just continuing to implement that also within the nurses, with, within whatever niche of staff you are within the hospital system and within the clinical system, I think it should be addressed and not just to those who are at the top as well. Mm -hmm. So a kind of continuing education. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we have, uh, sorry, next question from uh, Jacqueline. So Jacqueline says, I was wondering if non-oppressed people can have a kind of second hand, but somehow still legitimate distrust according to their support of attempted understanding of oppressed people. I can repeat if you want. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat? I think I know. I think I, think I understand. So they're similarly distrustful because they know that something like medical racism yeah. happens, even though it's not targeting them specifically. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to respond to that, Carissa? Or what do you think? Sure, I wanted to yield to you because I know you're <laughs> definitely the expert in terms of trust and distrust. I do think that's such a fascinating question in that you are distrust, just sorry, distrustful because you've seen it happen to someone else. I personally do think it is valid um, because if you know someone's, you know, motivations have been, you know, ill intentioned before, what's to say that they can one day, you know, not be ill intentioned toward you? So, I think it is valid, yeah. I do think so. And I also think it also plays on the idea that everyone should be, should have um, access and right to equitable and fair treatment. So if you're seeing um, a division of that, um, what's to say that um, another distinction between you and another person will affect your treatment and um, the vaccination you receive. So I definitely do think that that secondhand distress can open up a different sector of a type of distrust, a different root, um, but it's very much so valid as well. Mm -hmm. I sort of worry that, uh, you know, that you should be distrustful, yes. you know, not just sort of generally because of how they're treating others, but the possibility that, you know, one day that might, it could be, you. <laughs> that might, be, that might be you in that. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that was a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> So uh, the next question from uh, Charlene. So if we ought to be sensitive to cases of vaccine hesitancy, as you've described, then how do we address the conspiracy theorist? Mm -hmm. Chris, is that? Yeah, I'll just jump in in terms of conspiracy theories, because even if you look within the Black community, there are conspiracy theories related to historical injustices. There's people who misquote historical injustices and are mixing up with completely different things. There's religious, there's so many different things. So I don't think that there's one way specifically to target misinformation because some people will always gravitate towards whatever is exciting and controversial and oppositional. Um, but I do think it's just constantly repeating, like having clear communication, constantly repeating the same you know, facts, making sure that trusted people within the community are repeating those same facts and it's consistent across the board. So all medical professionals are having a consistent, you know, communication narrative so that, you know, eventually they might say, okay, 
I'm a little bit more, you know, open. But yeah, it, in terms of conspiracy theories, I think some people always hold on to them and that just is what it is. And I think we're not saying so much to provide a leeway for everyone who's vaccine hesitant based on historical injustice, but what we're saying is to be a little more sensitive and to understanding the reasoning. Um, like she mentioned, there will be conspiracy theorists and we're not saying, yeah, because there are theories based on historical injustice that, you know, it's accurate as, as it was really mentioned, it may be justified, but it may not, it's not, not necessarily accurate. Um, but we just want people to take that little time to understand and not necessarily um, divert uh, a vaccine hesitant into vaccine resistant or anti-vaxxers. So it's just the sensitivity to hear them out and try and acknowledge where they're coming from. And then from there, you can kind of um, see if it's um, sort of accurate or not. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think, I mean, some of the vaccine hesitant people were talking about the distrust that they have, you know, I think sometimes is justified. I made that point in our, our section. Um, and given the way I was talking about justification there and distinguishing it from being well-grounded, I mean, someone might try to argue, well, the, the people who believe in conspiracy theories, you know, they might be justified because everything around them is pointing in favor of this conspiracy theory. So maybe they're, they're justified, right? Because for the same reason that people who are responding to medical racism are justified. And, and I actually, I, I would push back on that by saying, I mean, often can, people who believe in the conspiracy theories have kind of orchestrated their own environment. They're, they're inhabiting what we call um, echo chambers in, in epistemology. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there's some, there's some agency on their part that has created this sort of environment for them. So they're, they're to some extent anyway, responsible for the fact that that's all they're seeing. Whereas when people are responding to medical racism, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. I mean, sometimes they, they may misinterpret it, but, you know, they're not responding to something unreal or something that's not there. So I do think those cases are, are different. And, you know, what really needs to happen with the conspiracy theorists is, you know, that they need to get out of that echo chamber. Just, I mean, whatever you can do to kind of pull them away from that, um, I think is what needs to be done. And that's a different situation from those responding to, to medical racism where, where they're responding to something that, you know, truly has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, a follow-up actually from Chris. I don't know if you remember, Chris was the person asking the question about historical cases where uh, uh, distrust might have been like overcame by uh, policymakers or so. Yeah. And so uh, Chris has a follow up to that. He's, a, he's asking, as an example of historical case for inspiration, how about cases like the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa, which I wouldn't know enough about, but maybe you guys do. I don't know much about that, so I won't uh, comment, but yeah. The commission in South Africa, is that what you said? Karen? Yeah, commissions in South Africa. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. Yeah. I have to say, like Chris, I'm, I don't know enough about how successful that, I mean, I think there still is quite a bit, bit of racial division yeah. <laughs> in South Africa. So, you know, similarly to the attempts here to deal with distrust in public institutions like the one that I mentioned. Um, you know, I mean, those those responses, some of them are a little more fresh, a little more new than, than what Chris is referring to. Um, but yeah, I think that that is likely, likely a good example, right? I mean, similarly with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here and in Canada and all of the steps that they've laid out, um, I think that, you know, as long as people are paying attention to them. <laughs> That's a helpful way, helpful way forward. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, so we have uh, two comments. They're not questions, so I don't know whether you'd like to, I can read them to you and if you have any reactions or you want to, if it inspires things <laughs> on your part, uh, just feel free to, to go ahead. So the first comment is, uh, from Itoro, 
And so Jago asked, this has been an excellent presentation. Emphasis is often laid on historical medical racism, forgetting that daily experiences is confirming the fear of racialized communities. Mm -hmm. So that's the comment. I don't know whether you want to add to that, but I thought so, yeah. So this is. I think it's very much true when we talk, when we say the word historical, we tend to think uh, it's left in the past, but um, it, the history is the foundation of today, right? So um, it's very much interwoven to what's going on today, and we still see it present in every every day, not just in medical institutions, but in everyday life, educational institutions, um, government institutions. Um, something as simple as going to the grocery store, you'll you'll you experience that. So I think, um, yeah, talking about the past is very necessary to also raise awareness of and highlight how it's continuing today in a different form, in a modernized way. So, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's also interesting because as I was reading, I found out a lot of people actually are not very well versed in terms of historical injustices. Their distress really just comes from what's happening today. So it's definitely really important to address what's happening right now because there's a ton of people who have no idea that, you know, Henrietta Lacks and Tuskegee, they don't even know the specific details of it. It's just words they've, they've heard, but that doesn't even inform their current distress. So, yeah. And I, I mean, one thing that really interests me in broader research I'm doing about the everyday injustices, things like stereotyping and microaggressions and, and all of these things, I, I think they contribute to, to a lack of a sense of belonging or, or a kind of othering of, of people who are members of these groups. And I think that has a lot to do with distrust. Um, with with a, you know a sense that I'm being treated like I don't I don't belong. So I think ultimately, you know, some people see it, say, some academics say we, we really are facing a crisis of trust on many levels now and in, in you know many continents, not just this one. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do we respond to that? And I, I think looking at belonging and people's sense of belonging, you know, that's something Western's looking at with its new strategic plan. I mean, belonging is a is a central feature of that because they they're recognizing that not everyone feels like they belong and and I think that really is goes to the root of um, you know the kind of distrust that we're that we're seeing not just in vaccines but in in other areas too and distrust in other public institutions like police for example so um, I really wanted us to bring in what we, we all did I think mm -hmm the everyday injustices and not just those historical cases. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. Uh, and the other comment we had from Megan, uh, so Megan says, fear of prescription drugs, fear that the doctor isn't taking them seriously in Canada's poor and mental Ill, mentally ill. In general, the poor are wary. Mm -hmm. Fear of sorry, so not taking. Um, so there, there's all kinds of fear. So it, it might go along what you were just saying. Actually, so it, again, it's a comment, not so much a question. Okay. So yeah. the person was saying that their fear of prescription drugs and fear the doctors isn't taking them seriously. Uh, so uh, and in Canada, uh, the the poor and the mentally ill. So it's just in general, the poor are kind of wary of of not being yeah. uh, treated for because there's those stigma because there's those uh, that's how i understand the comment yeah so it yeah. kind of goes along what you were saying just before it's yeah. not just uh racial uh medical injustice it's uh it's all kinds of aspects of our lives and it's all kinds of groups that are suffering yeah. from that yeah. i think that's a really good point i'm glad she brought in you know cases of um, people struggling with mental illness. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, so it's not limited to racial groups or, or gender-based groups. Um, you know, it's, it's also lies with people with disabilities or people with li living with health challenges, which are the people that medicine serves. I mean, um, and I, you know, one thing I, I wanted want to point out is, uh, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I did uh, what's called a clinical practicum in bioethics. So I actually shadowed doctors for, for a year. And I, and I saw this kind of interaction happen sometimes where you could tell some patients were just so uncomfortable in that setting. Um, and it was, it was often nothing that the medical professionals were doing. You know, it really just is built into this 
kind of unequal social structure that we have, where if you're someone who's poor or, you know, someone who's a racial minority or someone who's struggling with mental illness or has a physical disability, I mean, you know, in the sort of social hierarchy we have, you're, you're kind of, you know, at a place where you're in a different place than those who are medical professionals. And, and that can create this discomfort in this, in these settings. Um, and it can make patients very quiet. It can, you know, and, you know, it's not the medical professionals doing it necessarily. It's really, it really is structural. And we see medical racism as a structural phenomenon. I think Carissa made that very clear. And it's similar with other kinds of, you know, oppression that happen in this context. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, thank you, the three of you. That was wonderful. That's a great talk. Great Q&A as well. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, your very good questions and comments. Uh, and thank you for joining us again tonight.